Hello, everyone. I'm Jean-Claude Abion Mystic, and welcome to today's deep woo-woo episode of Nostradamus and the Vortex of Time. With us today, of course, is Mr. Jay Widener. You can find him at jwidener.com and also here on YouTube at Reality Check. Mr. Widener, Jay, welcome back. How are you? Hey, good. How are you doing? <laughs> Pretty good. We're covered in ice and snow, but pretty good. And of course, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Julie from MaisonJupiter.com here on the web and also here on YouTube at MaisonJupiter. Julie, there is, is it the wrong slide deck? What's going on? There you go. That's what was happening. Okay. <laughs> We're having some technical issues, folks. But first of all, welcome, Julie. Welcome back to the show. How are you? Very good. Hi to the two of you and hi, everybody watching. It's a pleasure to be here despite uh, this very... Um, odd weather crisis here uh, where we are in Canada. <laughs> right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And of course, um, when you guys see some weird issues like that, uh, please always take the reflex to go to beyondmystic.net forward slash schedule. As you can see here, I did indicate that we have this severe storm uh, weather notice in effect. We have a nice storm right now. And as you can see, many power lines are down. Trees are down on cars. And uh, yeah, up until just a couple of minutes ago, my own internet uh, service provider, the tower, wasn't up and ready. So it appears that we're running now. We're simulcasting on Julie's channel and on mine. We're going to do our very best to do the show. But let me just backtrack to the beginning here. Yes, this is where you can find Jay at jwinder.com and also here on Reality Check on YouTube. And of course, Julie at maisonship.com. Okay, now that all of that is out of the way, thank you folks for joining us here on this live interactive show. We'll try to do our best here. Uh, Julie, set the stage for this particular episode here of Nostradamus and the Vortex of Time. There's a lot happening in our realm. Um, we're, we're getting closer and closer to the storming of the Bastille. We saw earlier in France, uh, people were storming the uh, Black Rock uh, Enterprise uh, headquarters. And of course, here in the United States, we have a very distinct figure <laughs> that was just arraigned the other day, making a complete mockery of our judicial system. Julie, where the hell are we on this timeline and how does Nostradamus' <laughs> prophecies uh, maybe help us here navigate all of this crazy, crazy stuff? Well, great question. And I know Nostradamus uh, was famous for his kind of uh, apocalyptic predictions of like the whole world would go crazy, we'd have uh, natural disasters, man-made disasters. But personally, I think um, I'd like to look at more of the Aquarian archetypal um, energy that's coming in that also Nostradamus prophesized. So I think we're fully into it because Pluto just entered the sign of Aquarius and we're transitioning into the age of Aquarius, as you guys know. So uh, an Aquarius is all about rebellion. It's all about revolution. As you just mentioned, the storming of the Bastille that happened at the very last time that Pluto was in Aquarius. So when we look at the past, we can also kind of know what kind of portal of energy will be revisited with, um, let's say, another chance for us to make different decisions and to choose our future in a different way. And Nostradamus was really big also on that notion of not having a set future, but just kind of mentioning and looking at different timelines in the future to try to avoid the worst ones and choose a better one. So it's not, as a lot of people are saying, it's not uh, a fate we can't escape. It's more like um, empowering information to uh, really make conscious decisions. So today we're going to look at uh, two quatrains that I think are very uh, relevant at the moment with all this very Aquarian-like energies of revolution, freedom, uh, wanting to step out of the system, the matrix, which is very Aquarian, also technology, ET discoveries. Um, so we're going to look at two of those that talk about, um, let's say, some kind of downloads coming in on Earth and allowing us to uh, rediscover hidden knowledge about ETs, but also about our own Earth. Okay, very good. Let me bring up the first uh, slide. I see we're a little bit choppy here today, but so far the audio at least is coming through okay. So uh, let us know, uh, folks in the uh, live chat, if there's any issues either with the uh, sound or the audio, we'll try to adjust as we keep going. Uh, Julie, so the first quatrain is 714. Uh, set this up for the audience here. Okay, so um, he says in the first line, they will come to expose the false topography. And I just want to mention here some versions of the squatrain um, mentioned 
he will. Some other uh, versions mention they will, but in the French version, there is no pronoun. So it doesn't really matter. It's that will happen. That's basically what Nostradamus says here. So they will come to expose the false topography. So that's very interesting to me because uh, he kind of leaves that very mysterious. What kind of topography are we talking about here? So are we going to learn about the earth topography geography that is false? So are we going to rediscover earth geography uh, and the lies that have been um, tied to earth geography? So maybe our maps are not accurate and we'll update them. So that's kind of a, a possibility here. But the, all, the other one is uh, also exposing space exploration and uh, the planets of our solar system and probably beyond that have been colonized already and that I've been, uh, have built on already. So I think there's kind of two concepts here of topography that uh, Nostradamus is kind of hinting into. Um, and then second line, he says, the urns of monuments will be opened. So, uh, throughout a lot of quatrains, Noshona uses the word urns. Um, I, I notice not always as a funeral term, but mostly like an Aquarian archetype, because the Aquarian archetype has the urn as a um, as a water bearer. So it's a symbol of knowledge and it's a symbol of Aquarius. So um, to me, it's more like ancient knowledge will be rediscovered because he does talk about monuments. It talks about the past. It's hinting about the past in this quatrain, is this line. So hidden knowledge about sacred sites also kind of uh, came to me about monuments. So I think we, we're going to rediscover a whole lot of information about who we are, where we came from with those sites and um, having a lot of knowledge that is going to be available to us all of a sudden. So maybe because of an event, maybe because there's like an influx of uh, energy that uh, opens up our chakras, who knows? So I can't wait to see what Jay's gonna be uh, picking up here. And um, so another possibility here is a secret document found indicating contact with ETs. So uh, I'm, I'm writing a lot of possibilities. And then the other thing that kind of hit me when I was uh, reading that line was the Vatican and its secret library. So, um, and I know the Vatican came, came in, the, um, in our energetic field recently with uh, the eclipse coming up that is going to be at a very interesting portal of energy astrologically with the, the birth of the Vatican. So maybe the secret library is going to be made public, but because Nostradamus since seems to be hinting at some kind of, of event that will make a lot of knowledge available all of a sudden. So then third line, uh, thus multiplies the philosophy of the sacred or false sect. So here exposing the religions that kept us from knowing who we are and where we come from. Also, the age of Pisces, which was all about faith, dogma, religion. And then we're moving away from that in our kind of knowledge evolution to Aquarius, which is all about true knowledge, true science, and our interconnection to all human beings and also to stars. So I think we're moving away from those blinders that kept us um, in the religious system with the age of Pisces, opening up to more knowledge. So I think this lines refer to that. And then last line, black for white and the new for old. Wow. So to me, it feels like we're out of the dark ages and into the age of Aquarius because Aquarius is also a future oriented zodiac sign. So kind of entering the sci-fi world. Okay. So can we to see what you guys have to say about that? There's a lot in there and I'm going to ask you, Jay, to maybe break down a part by part. I'll bring them each uh, in order for you. But Laurie says, wow, Julie's intro. Can't wait to see where the show goes. Neither can I. That, that was actually a powerful <laughs> intro. Uh, Joel, let me bring, uh, Jay, let me bring this back up on the line for you as well. Um, for me, let me ask you about this uh, exposing of false topography. There's the idea, and you've mentioned this before on other shows, that the planet we live on might not be exactly as it's being portrayed. 
And when I see the quatrain, I also think about perhaps national boundaries, uh, this uh, fallacy of having boundaries between all of these countries that at some point here will have to be redesigned. What, what's your first take here on this false topography and how does that relate to perhaps the knowledge that is just um, before us now? Well, we know 10 years ago in 2013 that um, <clears throat> Vladimir Putin released all the maps of Tartaria um, mm -hmm. that had been secretly hidden inside the Kremlin. And um, that started the whole um, Tartarian alternative history, people going crazy like me, because, you know, there's this country that existed for a thousand years or so, and nobody ever learns anything about it in their history books. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and then that gives rise to, is there other things that we don't know about? And I've long um, advocated that there is an unknown country that is here on earth that is populated by uh, the elites and uh, they use it as their... Um, they're taking off ground place. So when they want to interact with us, then they use their flying saucers and everything. And they, and they come from this undiscovered country, which is kept off all the maps and all the globes and everything. And I believe that, <clears throat> I believe it's probably somewhere in the South Pacific. I don't know though. I would think that that would be the least traveled area on earth. So that's where I would probably uh, choose. And I think, you know, the very first people, as I said before, that get out into the open sea are going to know where everything is. And so they can redirect everything and, and everything. So I think that's a lot of what has to do with, and I also think that um, the release of the Tartarian documents and maps created an opening for us to now consider that there's a lot of possibilities that we weren't considering before. Mm -hmm. And that's opening us up to these um, technologies that are um, passive technologies that our forefathers in Tartaria were using uh, that we can now use. And we're now learning how to use these things. There's a great new um, emerging uh, gardening system called electroculture, for instance, mm -hmm. which is where you wrap, copper wire around a, a wood stick and you stick it down into your garden and it draws down all the energy into your garden. You don't need fertilizer. You don't need a bug uh, to kill the bugs. And, you know, I'm doing it right now in my garden and I'm really kind of blown away by it. And this again comes from looking at Tartarian architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we're going. Hey Jay, let, me, let me ask you, Jay, also, are you using structured water? Some people yes. are using in combination with that also the structured water. And apparently the yields are 30, 40, 60% um, bigger with that water being used as well. Go ahead. And, you know, you can buy the structured water magnet. I think I spent, what, 30 bucks, something like that. And I just clamped it around the pipe that's coming into my coming into my main system, right? And now all my water is structured, my shower mm -hmm. water, my plant water, everything. So, the, and this is cheap. I mean, you know, and so I think that that's what we're seeing is the emerging, emer and, and, the, and the decentralization of the Aquarian age is what's going to, you know, kick this thing forward because um, necessity is the mother of invention. So we're going to be out here and we're going to need these things and, you know, fertilizer shortages, for instance, are, are now going to become rampant. But if people buy a $40 magnet that magnetizes their water and creates structured water and you don't need fertilizer anymore, <laughs> right? So this is this is where I think we're all heading. I think that's what he's actually talking about. As for the mm -hmm. monuments, that's really interesting because the monument that I studied for 20 years in, in Enday, France, um, was built around the time of Nostradamus, we think. And it talks about, you know, the great cycles and the coming changes that are happening. Uh, this was 500 years ago, was talking about this, right? And many people have spent, and there's a bunch of these uh, kinds of monuments all over France, by the way, not just in Hende, but in, all over France, we've been finding them. And a lot of people have speculated that, that the, pedestal of the monument is hollow and that there could be important documents in there. 
Oh, I don't want anybody to go do anything, please. Don't <laughs> reference anything. But that, right. that has been speculated, and we were going to do an X-ray of uh, the monument to see what was inside it. But I think that from what I'm hearing, I'm hearing that there has been discoveries in Egypt that are inside these... They're not urns, but there's these granite boxes, and they're discovering stuff right now as we speak that is supposedly unbelievable. Mm -hmm. That's going to change everything. And, you know, we have to keep pressure on the people finding it to release that information and not hold it to themselves. And this is not Zawi Hawass or any of the main people in Egypt. This is uh, uh, people like me who uh, go in and are doing their own research. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is, a, from what I'm hearing, there is a bunch of really big stuff about to happen. And do you think, uh, let's backtrack here also, going back to the world map, you said maybe the South Pacific, but do you see the idea of perhaps this ringed planet also? Like we talked about this uh idea of uh, Atlantis um, fabled in, in a lot of our literature, but this idea of this map here where the planet is even bigger than we are and we're perhaps um, in a, colon uh, a colony uh, or encircled somehow and that the rest of the population of this planet doesn't really interact with us other than perhaps like you say here, either through uh, spaceships or even underground tunnel. Do you have any other data points that suggest here, including the Tartaria maps that uh, Putin just included. Is there anything else in your history field or in your books that suggests that, yeah, there's more here than meet the eye and perhaps the planet's even bigger or, or in a different shape than we actually think? I right. would, I would, I, I, I highly I think that we may live on a hollow planet. I think the earth may be hollow. I think that there's probably the, see, the problem is if, if the earth is hollow and there's an inner sun, right then it's perpetually warm in there right mm -hmm. and if there's an opening on the top and an opening on the bottom which does go with higher dimensional physics it would make sense that that there would be a, a vortex right the earth would be shaped yeah. like a vortex right then you would never okay so those openings those openings would be perpetually fog covered just like when you open your refrigerator, your freezer on a hot day, and you get all that, that fog coming out. That's because hot air and cold air are meeting, and that turns into fog. And so you would never actually see the openings, I don't think. Um, we would just go over a huge cloud bank. And we do have Admiral Byrd's uh, strange uh, statements that he made um, flying into uh, 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 Antarctica where he said he went into a land where it was tropical and he saw these animals and things. And, and um, I think there's something to it. That's all I want to say because people think of oh, hollow planets and hollow earth, but first off, it makes sense from a higher dimensional physics point of view. Secondly, <clears throat> we know that the earth expands that it, it was once about a quarter of the size that it is now. And it was covered completely in water. All right. And then it expands every once in a while. It expands more until you can see the continents that, you know, they all fit together. Right. Mm -hmm. And then expands outward as it expands outward. It creates a cavity inside. Right. And the molten core becomes the smoky God or the or the inner sun. And, and, and the earth is expanding. And, and we've gone through many expansions and we're going through one right now, in fact. And we're going to expect a lot of. Uh, a lot of damage to our uh, infrastructure over the next few years as as the uh, earth begins another expansion movement. So um, I think that there's a, a whole other world that exists right here with us that we don't know about that keeps itself secret from us and influences us heavily, especially mm -hmm. our religions. Mm -hmm. And they come in and they uh, they influence Doc Naughton, um, Muhammad, um, a lot Moses probably and they're and they're doing it because they're moving us towards something you know and now we're in the age of Aquarius it looks like they're about to uh expose themselves to us you talked about years. these uh, uh big sarcophagi or these big granite boxes uh in Egypt we just saw last month the discovery of a brand new tunnel inside uh, the yep. Great Pyramid of Giza. This is yep. on Graham Hancock's uh, channel. Um, I wanted to also ping your memory and your knowledge on perhaps 
the cavities below the paws of the sphinx. Yeah. Now, we've heard a lot of stories about that too. Can you bring that into the context here of these urns being opened as Nostradamus is talking about? Do you see also that connection with the sphinx and or here this new uh, tunnel in the pyramids? And what can you share with the audience? Yeah, the, we, we, the technology has become so advanced that we can now see the cavities underneath the paws of the sphinx. And I'm sure that, you know, they somehow worked their way in. As I think I've told you before, when I was at the Sphinx, I, I, I found a tunnel in the back, the rear end of the Sphinx, looked right down into the tunnel. Um, so there, there's tunnels, or there may not even be tunnels. There may be hallways and rooms in structures that have been covered over by sand. Mm. That's probably more likely what's going on in Egypt. And that's what Fulcanelli tells us at the front piece of mystery of the cathedrals is that the sphinx is sitting on top of another structure that's underneath it so that may be what's going on here but yeah there's a lot of really exciting stuff being discovered here recently and uh, weirdly enough a lot of it's pointing towards some kind of et thing um is what i'm hearing so okay that's my next question <laughs> don't go too fast jay everybody's mind blown already okay so in the web data report starting around i believe 2007 was the first time cliff saw this in his reports and then it was repeated over and over uh, let's say for the last 14 years or so there is a data set that at some point here we would have food riots uh the degradation of the dollar um the implosion of the religion itself, the Catholic Church itself from within, and that was tied to a data set of the storming of the Vatican. And in there, we would have this big title, which was Secrets Revealed. And so as we go underneath the Vatican, we look at perhaps um, the history and the books that are from the um, uh, Library of Alexandria. We look at the perhaps even occupied territories from other races, which brings us to Absolutely. our point. What can you share with the audience at that level as well? And perhaps um, even having this discussion right now is going to help a lot of people uh, go through that process when and if this actually comes to bear. And we're seeing now more and more of these monuments opening themselves up here energetically to their secrets uh, for the population. So what do you have in terms of the Vatican? Okay, so the Vatican, about uh, 10 years ago, Pope Francis put out this very odd statement that the transfiguration of Jesus was not solely just didn't just happen with Jesus. And everybody freaked out, especially the conservative Catholics. Like, what is he saying? This is the greatest heresy of all time. Well, I got into trying to find out what that was all about. And what has happened is, is that the Catholic Church has sent priests out over the last 20 years, and they've gone to Tibet and to India, and they found evidence of people attaining light body solid evidence that people have attained light body many times, including just a couple years ago. Father Miso um, went to Tibet, and he was two days late to the event, but he did find the nails and the hair that was left behind, and there were 20, 30 people saw the event happen. And so the Pope has come to realize, and the church has come to realize that probably um, – um, I forget his name, Ahsoka, the uh, Hindu, um, the guy who converted to Buddhism, sent out many, many um, people, to, uh, evang evangelicals out into the world. They went to the Middle East. We know that Jesus studied in India. He probably studied all the light body traditions that were uh, very going at the time. He came back and, and, he, and he did demonstrated it. And that's what happened. And so when they went to the tomb on the Sunday after the crucifixion, all they found was the, you know, the shawl with the shroud, shroud uh, that was left behind. And um, so the church is like completely falling apart now. They're completely, right. there will be no Catholic church very soon. They, they now realize that everything that they've been teaching has been wrong, that what Jesus was trying to demonstrate was nothing of what they were trying to uh, teach us. And uh, they're backtracking, and uh, they know that it's over for them. And um, I don't know what to say, except that, you know, if you really want to read, um, uh, it's called The Immortality Key. I forget the name, uh, the author's name, but he absolutely proves that the, the rites of the Mass, uh, of the Catholic Mass, up until about 
a thousand years ago were psychedelic. They were actually panting out psychedelics at the church mass. And that was what was really going on. And that these particular psychedelics will lead you into um, understanding how to take your biophotons and increase them to the point where they consume your body and you become light. I know it sounds crazy, but there it is right there. Great book, by the way. If you ever want to interview that guy. I don't think it's crazy. And Jay, uh, remind me also, in my registry somewhere in my head, I have this documentary or maybe a book that speaks about um, a temple somewhere in Tibet where you walk in and there's all of these glass urns of yeah. all the people who had achieved their exactly. light body or rainbow body and who had been cremated, but the cremated remains were all glowing independently with no technology. So there's yeah. that. There's a relation to this book. And if yep. you guys are interested to blow your mind even more, School of the Dead Men, uh, Cliff was just talking about psychedelics yesterday, as if he knew we were going to get into this topic here today. So go check it out. Uh, so, Jay, remind me about those uh, those urns, perhaps, with those uh, glowing um, human remains. Yeah, so uh, if they they have let certain people in, the uh, the, the lamas, in Tibet now they have to keep it cool now because the Chinese are everywhere now. But they have they they have these rooms where the remains of the light bodies, uh, like the, the like you leave behind your teeth and your nails, right? They they stay behind and they're glowing, right? And um, also um, uh, sometimes they'll just leave a little piece of calcium behind, right? Uh, that will be the only thing that's left behind. And then they'll put that into a, an urn, a see-through urn, and then that will glow. And they actually use it to read and stuff, right? <laughs> they use these urns to read. And um, and this knowledge has been uh, suppressed for thousands of years. And right now it's escaping, it's escaping in a big time way. And we know if you ever watch my video, my reality check, Secrets of Light and Dark, there are ways to fool your pineal gland. Your pineal gland is ruled by light okay, and dark. Okay, Serotonin is released when your eye, uh, eye, light hits your eyes. Melatonin is released when no light hits your eyes. That's why you shouldn't watch TV late at night. You're fooling your pineal gland. And you can, you can, you can do these exercises yourself to completely free. Uh, you know, you do need friends to help you, but you can practice these um, light body practices uh, without drugs um, completely with just light and dark and learning how to fool your pineal gland into excreting these things. We know that melatonin gives you long life. That's what it does. It, it, that's the two things of alchemy, enlightenment and a long life. Melatonin gives you a long life. Serotonin is one atom away from dimethyltryptamine. It's your own endogenous. That means it's within you. Your own endogenous DMT. It's you. So when you take your own DMT, it's, you know, the hyperdimensional thing happens and you're now regurgitating yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. um, Terrence McKenna once said that uh, DMT is like, oh, ayahuasca, which has DMT in it, is like giving birth to yourself through your nose. And um, and uh, that's what it's like. And that so sounds I like think a horror that, movie, that's Jay. Where, that's where we're headed here. And and, you know, and all and what's really amazing because I keep track, like you guys do, of all these different things that are happening, and they all seem to be reaching some kind of culmination right now, right? In every different place, whether it's Egypt or alchemy or psychedelics, and everybody's like, wait a minute, we're starting to reach conclusions that we could even conceive of five years ago. So exactly. it's pretty amazing. I love what you're saying about also the endogenously produced uh, chemicals. A lot of people are going outside for ayahuasca ceremonies and all that. But when you get into this technology, this light and dark you were talking about, uh, you guys can do that at home. You can set up your own dark room and you can spend some time in there to increase that effect here of this uh, endogenously produced uh, DMT. And um, when you go, oh, oh man, we could do a whole show on that, uh, Jay, but thank you. I really appreciate that. And I wanted to ask you this last question as you brought up your uh, reality check um YouTube and people, please go subscribe to Jay. There, he's got a lot of amazing information. Um, atop the page on your banner, you're you're showing an alchemy uh, poster, and I was wondering if 
in these light bodies and the remains of these light bodies, um, you know, in alchemy, how you use um, urine, sperm, blood, crystals, gold, silver to make the philosopher's stone. Have you seen any references anywhere of perhaps also using some of the remains of these light bodies? Uh, no, but it is what alchemy is. What alchemy is, is the alchemist is seeking to attain his light body, his diamond body, they call it. Right. And um, he's using all sorts of different things that help him achieve her too, because there's a alchemy is usually a, a man and a woman working together. It's a, she's called the Sora Mystica or the mystical sister, and he's the alchemist, and, but he needs to have her for the balance of it. And it's weird because over and over, there's one thing that keeps reappearing when this light body stuff is somehow it's related to forgiveness and compassion and love, right? It's like, you have to have all these things up front first, like Jesus, like the whole thing of Jesus, right? Yeah. He had to prove that he could forgive his enemies who were killing him literally before he could achieve this transfiguration, right? And the same thing with like Pabas and Baba and all the others who have achieved it. They had to go through this like whole inner process of, of um, I don't know, learning how to, uh, how to walk in other people's shoes kind of. Right. And, um, <clears throat> and alchemy is full of that too. How you got to, you, you know, you can't have these negative thoughts and you've got to, you know, or otherwise you'll screw the experiment up and, and all of that. But basically, alchemy is about absorbing light, how to turn your bio photons on so that you are emitting as much light as possible. Fascinating show, Jay. And there's a bunch of people in the chat saying, yes, let's do a whole show on this light technology. So, Jay, maybe we'll ask Julie here to create a uh, special cover for that. And we'll get into some of that research for you guys. And of course, yes, I agree with Lorianne. She says, wow, Julie, as usual, is a majestic mental mountain of knowledge well, i appreciate that laurie and of course uh julie just brought us into one hell of a rabbit hole with that first slide but uh, julie we have to keep going here there's more and it's there. crazy because my second slide uh deals with alchemy so it's one of the alchemy quatrains of nostradamus so can we get there it. with you guys i think it's right on the right on the money for today so yeah i um i was looking at the the book by dolores canet to get more information about the previous quatrain and oh i made a i made a mistake I, I just looked at the first line but okay so uh and it's going to uh let's say uh, lead us into the next subject which is i feel the alien exploration so let's dive in so in the book they say the phrase he will expose the false topography means he and uh let's remind the audience if you haven't seen the previous nostradamus show that the genius energy in our opinion deals with uh the aquarian archetype and not just one person let's say, uh, as a messiah coming here on earth and changing everything. It's more like an energy that we're all, we all have access to. So the genius is kind of this Aquarian archetype. So uh, he will expose a false topography means he, the genius, will show that the way things are looked upon, they will have a false appearance that the philosophies and science have been built upon mistaken premises, thereby building a mistaken picture of the universe. What he discovers and what he develops will help people come closer to the true appearance of the universe, how of how it really is in relation to the life force that per permeates everything. People will be able to free their inner selves and open themselves up to the higher powers and the higher levels of the universe. So it, it feels like uh, we're kind of accessing a new portal of energy that will give us access to um let's say more people may be transitioning into their light bodies more people having this knowledge also on how to do it and then second paragraph about the same quatrain uh he says but in this case the false topography is the cover-up so maybe the other meaning of what nostradamus really meant by topography this is the misinformation about the spacecrafts and space stations and all the misinformation of what the space program told us, they know the truth. I know there is also the false topography of what's happening in the photographing of various planets and stations and vehicles on the moon that were not put there by certain people. So that's kind of <laughs> mysterious end of the, of the line. So I think it does refer to uh, 
the the earth like not knowing exactly is it hollow uh is the north pole an opening is the antarctica another opening but also our knowledge of all that's been built on uh, the moon and other um uh let's say planets of our uh, solar system so if you go in the second slide jc or uh if you guys don't have any comment we can switch to the second one Oh, JC, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, I my audio is choppy on my end. I can barely see you guys. You're not moving. But everybody in the screen are saying that they're saying you. Okay, so it has to be at okay. my end. Um, yeah. yeah, let me let you go to the second slide right away. It'll give me time. I'll try to get off a screen here and maybe reboot my router, and I'll come back, and I'll <laughs> we'll try to keep the show going. Okay, keep going. Um, right. Julie, I'll bring up my slide, but you might lose it here if I uh, reconnect. So let me just put it oh, on the screen. Okay, I'll bring if, mine. Don't if worry. not, you have it on yours as backup as well. Okay, so uh, let me bring up the second one. This one here, Julie? Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll be back in a sec. Go ahead. Okay. So um, there's another... Oh, okay. So I'm just going to bring mine on the screen. Here we oh, go. Yeah. So uh, there's another book that I own uh, that was given to me by my sister. So this is Nostradamus, The Complete Prophecies. So it's like a, a whole brick of all the prophecies. Yeah. Honestly, the interpretation in it are so-so. They're not my favorite, but I do like to look at the different uh, translation of the quatrains and sometimes the explanations of them. So this one is by John Hogg. And to him, the quatrain that we just looked at, uh, exposing the false topography and all the documents being revealed, to him, it relates to uh, the French Revolution. So uh, honestly, that was quite surprising to me, but uh, he does um, make the link also that uh, the, the, the quatrain is number 7Q14, and uh, the storming of the Bastille happened on the 14th of July. So on the seventh mm -hmm. month of 1789, <laughs> which is a very important date in astrology as well, because it's the last time that Pluto was in Aquarius. Yeah. Yeah. So um, do you understand why they would link it with the French Revolution, this quatrain, Jay? Do you have an idea? Um, I don't. Uh, I know John, and he. I, I agree with you. I don't normally care for his interpretations that much um of, of nostradamus but uh, i'd have to can we look at it again maybe, maybe I'll, i can I'll see bring, what he's talking about yeah let me bring this oh here we go so um yeah they will come to expose the false topography the urns of monuments will be opened thus multiplies the philosophy of the sacred or false sect black for white and the new for old I can see where the multiplies the philosophy of the false sect could be uh, the, the French Revolution. That that does. Yeah, me too. The, the last one. Kind of... I don't know about that one. Yeah. Yeah. But it is interesting that he's pointing towards the last time that Pluto was in Aquarius. Yeah, exactly. So I think he's kind of maybe hinting at uh, an end of an era of a way to think, a way to uh, understand philosophy. And yeah, it's so interesting because we're also, uh, Pluto just moved into Aquarius. So it's kind of pushing this Aquarian archetype even more. And um, so we're kind of having this rediscovery of hidden documents, which is also Pluto. Pluto um, reveals stuff that was uh, previously hidden. And Aquarius is all about technology. It's all about things that um, kept us from, uh, attaining freedom. So uh, the knowing of our rights and knowing of uh, the technology I just said. Also, it deals with astrology, interestingly enough, and it deals with AI and uh, our connection to ETs and to the stars. So very interesting. And I just made the parallel here in the second part of the slide that uh, 14 in tarot numerology, because we all know that Nostradamus was very adept of both tarot and astrology. So he did number himself his quatrains. And it's kind of very mysterious what it uh, correlates with all the numbers. But he did say in the um, Dolores Cannon book, 
uh, that was channeled, of course, that it had a meaning, but he didn't say what the meaning was to say. So he said, oh, you have to, to, to look further and find it yourself. But I know 14 in tarot numerology deals with the temperance card. And to me, that's another Aquarian archetype because you see he's dealing with uh, vases that can be urns, water, which is kind of the symbol for knowledge and communication about that knowledge. Thank you, JC. <laughs> and um, so communication, balance and knowledge. And there is also an angel and an urn. So very much Aquarian. And this, uh, this number of the quatrain, 714, if we add the numbers together, it's the world card. So kind of the end of an era and a big change on how we experience the world. So all of what you just said previously about us um, kind of doing things that look supernatural, uh, attaining light bodies, makes total sense because kind of the physics of the world are changing because we're also changing era with Pluto and Aquarius. So that's right. That's exactly right. 14 is also the number of, uh, of part uh, pieces that uh, set cut Osiris up into. So oh, wow. had, and then spread it. He spread the, uh, every piece all over the, the planet. And Isis had to go around and pick them all back up. And she only got 13. She was missing the phallus. So she had to create a golden phallus to which she impregnated herself with and had Horus, who went back and got revenge. And so it's the whole alchemical story of dismemberment, regrouping, re-resurrection, right? And then rebirth. No. So 14 wow. is that. Also, JC, you're muted. Oh, okay. I think I'm back. Um, yeah. Going back to these monuments from earlier, do you think the phallus is maybe here at St. Peter's Square? Is it maybe uh, in Washington, D.C.? Uh, it, it's probably, I don't know where it's at, but it's, you know, it's probably been one of those places or the three main places or what? London, mm -hmm. Vatican, and D.C. So um, that's where they keep all the stuff. It's probably in D.C., like, you know, the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark in right. that warehouse there somewhere. Right. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, going back to, I missed part of it there I, as I had to reboot. I wanted to get back into the ET uh, component. Uh, Julie, you brought up the fact that, of course, uh, Pluto was entering Aquarius. In this particular episode, Pluto the Destroyer. If you guys haven't seen it, go check it out on our uh, Rumble feed. We talked about, going back to the quatrain here, the removal of the sect or the removal of the cults. We talked about some of the figures in the ET community and their masks haven't been uh, dropped here as of late so that we can actually enter into real uh, disclosure and a rapprochement between us and our actual star families. Jay, I know this is a difficult subject, if not an impossible subject for you to speak online. Can you share anything about what's going on right now, even not necessarily about the particular gentleman on the screen, but this idea of um, having to remove all of those false uh, gurus, those cults around the ET uh, conversation, and where you see things moving forward here as we are definitely coming closer here to this bigger conversation about extraterrestrials. Well, everything's moving to, to cults, everything now. Politics, art, movies, everything is cults now. And it's very disconcerting because cults don't really learn to think for themselves. They usually follow a charismatic leader but at the same time, it seems like um, like the mask is coming off of everybody, and and they they can't really run and hide. And um, people have had you know a very jarring learning experience where they believed what people were telling them, and then that person then ends up saying that no, everything I just said wasn't true. And so they get all crushed and hurt and, you know, they, they free energy was promised in 2015 and zero G vehicles were promised and it was all going to happen real soon. And then none of it happened. And here we are years later and none of it happened. And so what it did is it, it demoralized the community. Oh. And uh, so, so it was a very bad thing. And, um, and so, but the community learned. And so now the community is like, is going to demand to see the receipts from now on, I think. And uh, so, you know, it was a bad experience, but it was a good experience. But here's the thing. If we can get the secret of alchemy out into the world 
so that everybody can practice alchemy, um, light body practice, then we've won. Then we've undermined the entire structure of the uh, of the world. The, the whole structure will be undermined. You don't need food when you're a light body. You don't need to sleep. You don't need right, and and you don't have to. Uh, uh, and 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 you can you, you it can be a slow process. So this is why it's so suppressed, mm -hmm. and why the church taught it all wrong because it has to be suppressed because it's the one thing that will overturn the power structure. Mm -hmm. And so they can't let it happen. And, um, and I don't care anymore. And I think there's a whole bunch of people that don't, don't care anymore. And so we're just saying it out loud. And, uh, and I even think the Pope is, uh, you know, I think he's been shut up and, uh, after he made the statement, but you know, it'd be interesting to see what he has to say about all this. Mm -hmm. And that's why in our last episode, Julie and I, uh, with Penny Kelly, we were talking about creating this uh, new course on the academy about sex. <laughs> Not sex per se, but Kundalini, the technologies behind sex and why all of that was obfuscated from our um, collective field of view and why the religions are working very hard in tandem with the distortion of sex. Again, so that we don't get into the Kundalini, the Chi, the Prana, uh, the mechanisms into that uh, light body scenario you were just you know, it's interesting. I have a book. I got. I found it in Europe years ago, um, and it's a medieval book on sex, a European wow. medieval book on sex, and it's teaching tantra. Hmm. Yep. Oh wow. It's teaching tantra. I was like, what? You know, like this can't be. And so they knew about it. That's what I'm trying to say is that the that all the stuff that we think we are all discovering here in the last 40 years or whatever. <laughs> been around forever i mean <laughs> all of this stuff has been around forever so exactly. we're just rediscovering it right wow thank you jay appreciate that uh julie we're 46 minutes in uh i'm getting what i'm hearing from you guys is very choppy so i know it's probably on my end still we're having the issue For, from your perspective everything sounds good julie yep okay uh, let's keep going then. I'll bring up the uh, next slide here. Yes. Uh, Julie, you wanted to uh, bring into context, of course, today, um, oh, yeah. the representation of what we kind of touched on the uh, Pluto, the Destroyer uh, episode on Rumble, this idea that we're in those same axis uh, now in the same alignment as we saw in 1789, which, of course, led to the uh, storming of the Bastille. We just got Mr. T arraigned the other day, and we're having... Uh, crazy, crazy bank runs as we speak. And if you guys have been following uh, Cliff High in the last couple of days also, he's been telling uh, people to uh, buy silver and to buy it now. Um, and this uh, is the video you're looking for, heavy metal. Uh, you'll get some more context now. And he was saying that perhaps within the next two weeks even, the silver in the pipeline coming in for delivery is also evaporating. So there's big happenings right now in the silver market. As we know, uh, it uh, passed the $24 mark at closing last Friday, which was a huge line in the sand. And of course, on Mr. T's arraignment day, we passed $25 uh, dollars per ounce. So there's a lot happening there. Julie, set this up for the audience members. Um, the uh, 1789 correlations to what's happening today and see what Nostradamus had to say about it. Yeah, so uh, the correlation between the French Revolution and the previous quatrain, to me, I wouldn't have uh, made a link between those, but I found it very interesting because that was the last time Pluto was in Aquarius and also the last time that the nodes were in the financial axis, 1789. So right now the nodes are uh, in the same place. So the North node is in Taurus, South node is in Scorpio. So we're letting go of all the power structures that's been enslaving us financially. And that was kind of the same karmic topic that was happening back then in 1789. So uh, just before the storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789, there was also a major economic crisis at the time of Louis XVI. So a big financial shift was sort of happening and that led to a powerful revolution. And of course, it ended up as being the end of monarchy. France became a republic. So you see this very uh, emphasized Aquarian archetype of liberation, equality. And that was also part of the motto for the French Republic, equality, uh, brotherhood. I can't remember exactly what it was, but very much Aquarian, that uh, we're all equal under the law also. And that also came with uh, the same year, the Declaration of the Rights of Men from the Assemblée Nationale in French. So uh, in France, I mean. So 
basically that gave more legal rights to ordinary people, uh, equality before the law. And it was kind of the foundational document for democracy in Europe. So you kind of see also this Aquarian archetype of uh, wanting to be equal, um, not wanting to have a middleman between you and uh, your, your fellow citizen and your resources, you and your knowledge, you and, you know, you get the drift. So, and that also led to the creation of the middle class, which I think is one of the most important uh, things to mention here, because before that it was very polarized between uh, the rich people, the the aristocrats, the, the royalty, and then you had uh, the bottom of the pyramid, the poor people. So there was no middle class before the revolution. And last time Pluto was in Aquarius, uh, it created a middle class. So I, I found it and we uh, we touched on it on the Pluto uh, in, in a Pluto the Destroyer episode that also I feel like that was why um, since 2020, uh, they attacked the middle class more than any other, uh, let's say, level of society because it was the one that could start a revolution and bring uh, the power down. So, and they knew also that Pluto, once it entered Aquarius, would change the whole power structure. So they would disempower the middle class before it could happen. And the the, the kind of the wind was in our sails. So very interesting. JC, you're uh, still muted. Uh, Julie, just to bring another point there too, I want to have Jay on this. Uh, set up the uh, video you did or the questions that were set up here from some of our tarot readers with respect to how Quebec was attacked during the mm. uh, pandemic and also France and how perhaps they were attacked even more than some other jurisdictions around the world. What's the correlation between that 1789, Pluto, and perhaps the role of the Cathars? Set that up in a question uh, for Jay. <laughs> yeah, uh, very interesting uh, link. Merci, uh, JC. So basically, um, we had our staff retreat recently that was in the north of Quebec. So we gather all of the Beyond Mystic Maison Jupiter family together. And so a lot of uh, the French culture came in our uh, field of energy, the French language, of course. And and then we were talking to realize that like the, the measures since 2020 were the worst in France and in the French part of Canada, which is Quebec. So and then I was like, huh, is it is it how is it interesting? And I know, uh, of course, there's been other parts of the world that has been severely hit by those measures. But why would they hit the French people more than everybody else? So that I kind of hinted that to Janine and she did a whole card pull on her uh, Beyond Ravens on Rumble. And she got that because um, the people were more in the financially independent. So a lot of small businesses were owned by French uh, francophones, so French speaking people, but also they were more independent thinkers. Yeah. So they were targetly, uh, very consciously target, targeted by um, those measures to try to bring them down because they knew they were the one that could rebel the most for uh, the one world government type of project. And also it came into, like I receive a lot of emails from people uh, after that uh, from Quebec, and they were kind of alluding also to the, the Qatar's uh, tradition that uh, were uh, in France. So I think there is a whole length of DNA maybe, um, I don't know, bloodlines having to do with Cathar. So I'd like to hear you, Jay, what you think on, on that topic. Um, yeah, I think you hit it right on the head there. Um, uh, the French uh, absolutely refused to go along with anybody, um, and they're notorious for it. Um, you, you, you try to tell the French that they have to put certain additives in their food and they'll just start screaming and yelling at you. And, uh, they, and, and um, uh, there's something about the whole culture that is a threat. And it's always been that way. And um, that's why England's constantly invading France. And the Cathars, of course, were... Um, a uh, very uh, Gnostic um, group of people who had women as their priests and they had uh, uh, sacred healing rites 
and uh, they refused to become Catholics. And of course, the Catholic Church destroyed them in the in the Inquisition, uh, to which the Pope famous, was asked, how can we tell the Cathars from the Catholics? And the Pope said, kill them all. God will figure it out. And uh, so they came and they killed everybody in the south of France. And I wrote a whole screenplay about this and I actually had Leonardo DiCaprio interested in it uh, at one point. This is about 20 years ago. And um, uh, but I, I couldn't get financing. But I, the whole story is amazing. And there's another point that needs to be said about this. And because the Cathars and the French Revolution have something in common and, and with also today with what's going on. And that is that uh, the French Revolution did not succeed until the women got involved. They hmm. were not involved. And then when the food prices started going up and they couldn't feed their kids, they started getting really pissed off. That's when the revolution started. The same thing with the Cathars. The Cathars were ruled by women. Um, there, there, there was a whole class of women that ruled them, and that really irritated the um, the church and England. And today, what really scares the powers that be, I think, are, is the fact that women are rising up. They're going to school board meetings, and they're starting to make their voices heard. And I don't think they know how, they know how to handle this. They, you know, what are you going to do? Go beat up the woman? I mean, what, what are we going to do about this? And it becomes like a very, uh, a very um, uh, upsetting point for uh, the people in power to have, you know, all these women complaining and yelling at them and saying, you can't do this. And how dare you teach my kids this and all of that. And um, it's having an effect. And I believe that if we have a revolution, I don't think we're going to have a violent revolution, but I think it's going to be led by women. It's going to be a, a cultural revolution that would be led by women and the men will follow because right now we can't say much as men anymore. So it's going to have to be women because we just get called names and told that, you know, we're just, uh, what is it? Man, man escaping or whatever they call it. <laughs> you really can't do anything. Men have to let women do it now. You just can't do it. Yeah. And I, I have to say, like, it's very Aquarian again, because Aquarius to me is all about balance between your inner yeah. divine feminine and inner masculine. So it's not about women overpowering men, which is no. kind of what uh, the, the mainstream wants you to believe that, oh, yeah, I'm an empowered woman, meaning like I'm trying to be a man. So that's not <laughs> at all what it's supposed to be. Aquarius, in my mind, is to be a balanced individual just, with it. I just keep losing connection. So I left. You guys were talking about the, the banking system. And I came back. You're talking about manscaping. So I'm not sure what I did. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah, we went a long way, JC. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I heard you say DiCaprio. Um, with respect, I think Jay was saying that he had a script for him. What was interesting in the news today, too, he's out there fighting, of course, um, unveiling some truth bonds there about the Obama yeah. campaign and some of the uh, campaign finances and maybe laundering yeah. stuff. So I thought that was funny. Um, What's your view on this character, uh, DiCaprio, at this point? Where is he on the spectrum here uh, fighting this spiritual war? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I know that he's uh, very interested in um, the Templars and the Cathars and, and all of that. And um, uh, I think he's in, his heart's in the right place. I think he's been a little, you know, the problem with being a, a white guy in Hollywood these days is you have to act really well or you're not going to get any jobs. So mm -hmm. it's hard to tell when a white guy's acting woke, if it's real or not, like the guy that played captain America, he's super woke. Right. And he's super white guy. Right. And it's like, I don't believe him. I just, I don't believe it. I believe that he's probably, he probably has to do this kind of thing. So I can't really tell. I know that, Leonardo is 53 years old and he's dating a 19 year old. And I think he's pissed off a lot of, of feminists and stuff with that one. But um, hey, whatever, you know. He's got I thought, I thought his cutoff age was 18. So at least he's <laughs> broadening the spectrum there a little bit. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think this is what you guys were referring to with the manscaping and all the uh, crazy transgender yeah. stuff, all these uh, brands um, losing their shit here. Of course, Travis Tritt uh, is uh, seconding the uh, video that uh, Kid Rock did the other day, of course, uh, admonishing <laughs> here uh, Anheuser-Busch and the Bud Light series. Also, Nike now is in trouble for all this. Absolutely crazy. Um, Julie, we have quite a few more slides, man. I keep losing connection. I'm having trouble uh, following with you guys. What do you think? We're all... Well, 
Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Let's do another one, Jay, if you agree, okay. and then we can get on uh, the yeah. alchemistic quatrain that I really wanted to have your input on because I think right. it's going to be a great, uh, a great addition to this one. Okay, he's back maybe for our uh, ending. You guys, you guys want to call the show because I can't yes, do this anymore. Yes, let's do another one to talk about alchemy more. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you for all the comments and supporting us here, even though we're having all of these weird technical uh, issues here with this uh, ice storm that both Julie and I are uh, being affected by here from the bandwidth and also from the uh, internet and power outage, uh, power outages as well thank you so much for joining us here today guys please in the meantime go and support our friend here jay weiner you can find him at jayweiner.com if that works i don't know it's like coming up on the screen nope <laughs> of course on his youtube channel as well as reality check and you can find julie oh here we go so we can find jc you can at find reality, julie check. reality check yeah <laughs> hopefully <laughs> soon and then yeah. uh Thank you so much, Jay. That was amazing. You always bring such amazing content, and I can't wait to talk to you again. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and Thank see you. you very soon. Au revoir. Bye.